veterinarian, I have one of those jobs that when you're out and about and you meet someone for the first time and they find out what you do, the first thing they go is, oh, you're a veterinarian. And then they probably pull out the picture of Fluffy from their wallet and start to tell you the life history of their pets. And there's no filter to the conversation. It's puppy vaginitis, chronic bowel problems, breeding infertility. There is no subject that is off limits. And you know, I honestly don't mind. But funnily enough, you know, people don't meet other professionals the same way as they meet the vet. They don't meet the GP at a party and, and suddenly talk to them about the funny rash down there. <laughs> or the accountant and quickly whip out last year's financials. For some reason, vets are kind of considered differently, like we are here simply because we love animals. And it's true, you know, there's certainly a lot of, lot of truth to it, I, I really love what I do. But sometimes the fact that we're so focused on our animals perhaps also detracts from the fact that we're actually also businessmen. And sometimes we're not very good businessmen. And we don't learn a lot about business, but you know, vet clinics are a business. We don't have government-run hospitals or uh, clinics like they do in human medicine. Vets are all employed by other vets in a small business, with the exception of universities and research. But you see, we don't learn anything about running a business when we're at university. There's no, no inventory control class between equine medicine and dermatology. So everything that we kind of know when we graduate is usually from trial and error or from Google. So when vets get a system that works, we don't really like to change it very much. And the fact is, the veterinary business model hasn't changed much since our grandparents were taking their pets to the vets. This system of ring up, Bring pet in to visit the veterinarian, vet does consult, dispenses medication or admits for treatment, owner pays as they go. It's been the same for decades. So we might have a few more bells and whistles. We might have, say, computer systems now, and we might have those point of sale scanny things, but no real change. But you know, vets don't really like change. They don't really want it, because change is actually really, really hard. It's a lot of hard work. The fact is, though, the world hasn't stayed the same. The world has changed. And even more so now, we're seeing it change at this colossal rate. So much so that now our industry, our veterinary industry, like many industries before us, are now being faced with the dreaded digital disruption innovation. Disrupt or be disrupted. It sounds ominous. You might be wondering, what does it mean? A lot of vets probably wouldn't know and probably don't really want to. But I'll give you the definition of disruption. I have to write it down. It's an innovation that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, displacing established market leaders and alliances. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that quite complicated. But um, it's also a bit scary. It's displacing established market leaders and alliances. It's changing standard practices and doing things differently. Now, from a veterinary perspective, certainly change is okay. Change is all right. But um, disruption isn't a new thing. Disruption's been around for some time, and, and the term was first coined back by Clayton Christensen back in 1995. But you know, it didn't really gain a lot of momentum back then. But now with the world being so connected and this whole technology joining us so much, we're seeing disruptive business models accelerate at a, at a huge rate. Uber, the obvious one, which just completely turned the taxi industry on its head. But it's also snuck into our world as well. We've, we're learning differently with Google. We're advertising differently with Facebook AdWords, Facebook advertising. You know, we had, uh, my kids had a fundraiser not long ago where they had to deliver phone books door to door. None of the kids had any idea what a phone book was, let alone why on earth someone would possibly want one. <laughs> but I'm a veterinarian and I'm an animal lover, so I like to think of the world in terms of pets. For example, I train my children to sit for their dinner the same way as I do my dog, and that is with rewards-based training. And I like to think of disruptive innovation and disruptive business models 
as simply adaptation and evolution. You see, I believe disruptive business models are simply a great example of Darwin's theory of evolution and survival of the fittest. Just as thousands of years ago, animals came down from the trees, started to wear clothes, use tools, and started farming for food, so too the world has changed. People have got new needs now. You know, we're so busy, the world is so complicated. You know, both men and women are in the workforce. They're having to, you know, be more flexible with their workforce now because, they're, because both men and women are working. We're time poor. No one has time to stand in the line at the post office anymore and actually pay their utility bill. We do all of this sort of stuff online. So if we don't adapt as business owners and as professionals to what the people are asking for, well then we too become dinosaurs and face extinction. Now I haven't always, I haven't always felt this way. I too was once afraid of change. And it wasn't until I moved from a, a conventional city practice down south and moved up to a, a more regional practice and found that there was all these little outback towns dotted within several hundred kilometres all around us. And these outback towns, they had pets in them and pet owners. And these owners were like police, were doctors, were nurses, teachers, all pet owners, but no one with a vet clinic that was within driving distance. So when they had a problem with their pet, they would ring us up on the telephone. And as vets, none of us really knew what to do because the whole phone call thing didn't fit into our normal business model. This whole system of ring up, book appointment, bring pet in, vet examines, dispenses medication, owner pays as they go, completely fell apart. Where do I dispense medications? How do they pay as they go? So when the nurse was around, phone in hand, walking around, trying to find a vet for someone to talk to an out of town client, the immediate reaction by all the vets was obviously to hide. First thing you do is try and look terribly busy and as though you're doing something much too important to be disturbed. Thankfully for us, back then, there wasn't quite so many people that were ringing up. You know, there wasn't as, as many pet owners back then. But now, the world has changed. Those little outback towns have gotten lots bigger. And perhaps it's, it's Google, more education, but these owners are becoming a lot more vigilant about their pets as well. We're finding that they're suddenly caring when the dog's been limping for a month or they've suddenly run over the cat. Dr. Google certainly can't help with everything is quite often wrong, certainly can't dispense medications. So we were seeing that our industry, our veterinary industry, suddenly having the conservative veterinary model being challenged and an alternative to the status quo finally being born and that is vets having to not hide anymore from the nurse but accept evolution and adaptation. And that is, now we have telemedicine for pets. And this is a fast growing area where people are suddenly accepting this whole new way that we are consulting. And it's completely different. The system of the owner now books online, pays first, then has a consultation with a, with a link through the veterinarian, through the screen, and then the vet either sends a portable prescription, sends out medication, or organises, if need be, for the pet to be transported to, a, to the nearest clinic. The whole way we consult is completely different. The vet has to describe to the client and drive the client to, to perform a series of tasks so that the, the vet can extract information from the pet, so they can make a decision as to whether the pet is actually critical or not. But also, from a business perspective, it alleviates the costly expenses of investment in bricks and mortar and equipment. So we've also got the ability to be able to, to access a, a, a pool of veterinarians that can live anywhere in the world and, and, uh, and work whatever times they want to. So from a vet's perspective, I can see it's really scary, but it's also really challenging for the governing uh, for the governing bodies in order to be able to try and regulate. But it's not just these external demographics that are driving this change. We're also finding within our veterinary industry there's internal changes as well. 
and that is within the, the, the vets themselves. So I was a soul charge practitioner back in a, a tiny little town called Nornboy, and that is some 10 hours drive on a dirt track to get to the nearest town. I had a two-year-old uh, two and I had a nine-month-old baby and a husband that was working shift work both day and night. So providing an after-hours service was literally impossible and certainly the gruelling challenges of, of work-life balance was nearly impossible. So for me, I was lucky, at least, you know, being a hands-on mum, I wanted to have my kids with me. I could at least take them to the clinic with me. But, you know, I saw so many of my colleagues in that same situation with postgraduate degrees and 10 years' worth of experience being forced out of the workforce because they wanted to raise a family. Now, you see, our industry is changing quite a lot, particularly with gender. So in 1995, 60% of our graduates were actually female. And now, in 2013, that's actually gone up to 83% of graduates being female. So there's also been an actual noted drop in full-time employed vets come mid-career. So the numbers are a little bit sketchy, but the Australian Veterinary Association predicts that within 10 years' time, as the male vets retire and leave the, leave the industry and these graduates move on forward, that we're actually going to have a shortage in veterinarians, particularly experienced ones. And that's despite there have been two new vet schools that have opened and more graduates being produced. So digital consultation certainly has the ability to help fill this gap in our changing industry. So do I think that digital consultations are going to be the demise of vet clinics as we know them? I think probably not. Just as you know, Google Maps and eBay and you know, Netflix have all taken time to, to really gain momentum and for people to accept them, I think vets are always going to need a tactile consultation. The astute vets, they'll embrace it. They'll perhaps start incorporating digital, um, digital consultations into their, into their practice and maybe offering it to, the, to some of the, the clients that they already have. Or maybe they might even start coming up with some tools that will help the consultation process. For example, maybe a, a Fitbit for pets that can measure heart rate and perhaps how much the, the pet is scratching while you're not around or running around while you're not at home and they've got a cast on. It's embracing, it's embracing innovation and digital disruption to avoid extinction. <coughs> Becoming one of the fittest to survive. So, if your industry is staring down the barrel of disruption, what are some of the top things that you can do? What are key things that I think you need to embrace in order to survive? Number one is courage. If Neanderthal man had been afraid of fire, he would never have harnessed it to keep him warm. Don't be afraid of what is coming. Use it to your advantage. Adapt to your surroundings. Now, I don't mean you need to be a chameleon and completely blend into your surroundings, but if the ice age is coming to an end, and you're still living in an igloo, then there's a really good chance it's probably going to melt. Best start working out how to make a hut out of sticks. And finally, be smart. Be smart and be aware of what's going on around you. Educate yourself. It takes more than an opposable thumb to survive. 